Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Barbara Hamley. Another view is live along the shore of the Chesapeake Bay at Fort Monroe in Hampton, Virginia, the site of the first landing of Africans to English North America. Up next on the show, we'll talk about that first landing and how Fort Monroe played a pivotal role in slavery and emancipation. There's a lot going on here as workers ready Fort Monroe for tomorrow's official launch of a multi-year journey to 2019, the 400th anniversary of the beginning of our nation. We've got a live audience and a stellar panel to bring us and another view history lesson. That's next, right after this news from NPR. Discussing today's topics from an African-American perspective, this is Another View. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Another View. We are live from beautiful Fort Monroe here in Hampton, Virginia. We've got a live studio audience. Hey, everybody. They are all here. We're right by the water. We're about 200 yards away from the marker that uh, commemorates the landing of the first recorded Africans to come to English North America. And it is the beginning today of a celebration this weekend, and it's going to be fabulous. So if you happen to be near Fort Monroe, you're on 64th. Come on off on Woodland Avenue, take a, take a detour, and come on by and watch us do the show live. Um, so, as I said, Fort Monroe is the site of the arrival of the first recorded Africans to English North America. Now, that happened in 1619 and is one of three key events that year that helped shape America. 1619 was also the year of the first representative legislative assembly in the New World. Women had a significant impact on the Virginia colony. And the first English Thanksgiving was held. Now, did you learn all this in your history class? We're going to talk about that. We have a lot to talk about on this Another View history lesson. So let's meet our guest. Glenn Oder is the executive director of the Fort Monroe Authority. Hey, Glenn, welcome back. Absolutely. We're so glad to have you here. Terry Brown is the new superintendent of the Fort Monroe National Monument. Hello, Terry. How are you? Great. Nice to meet you. Absolutely. Tina Rollins is the director of the Hampton University Library. Hi, Tina. Hi, Barbara. How are you? I'm great. Welcome. And Vanessa Thaxton Ward is the director of the Hampton History Museum. How are you? Hampton uh, University. Yes, ma'am. Hampton <laughs> University. Hampton University, Hampton Museum. University, University Museum. How I'm are great. you? Great. Thank you so much for joining us. So this is a beautiful thing. Glenn, a lot of activities happening around Fort Monroe. Give us a sense of what's going on right now. Well, it's very exciting. I mean, behind us, you know, the tents are going up and uh, you see the golf carts going up and down the road as they're ferrying, uh, you know, supplies here and there. Uh, there's lots of infrastructure that is going to be temporarily installed so that we can uh, we can have people come to Fort Monroe and experience uh, you know, the launch ceremony that's going to be tomorrow at noon, but also earlier in the morning, there's going to be Project 1619, yes. which is the founding, founding, they created the founding ceremony that where we begin to tell the story of the first Africans that arrived here. And so, you know, it's an interesting topic because while I, what I've described almost sounds like a festival atmosphere, um, you know, this is not a festival celebration. At least that's not the direction we're heading. In. It's more of a commemoration. You know, this is an issue, uh, an, uh, a subject that we want to commemorate, we want to study, and we want to use the next four years, you know, starting with this year, we want to use the next four years to, to educate the public about the importance of this day, what it meant to our country when these first Africans arrived here, and what it has meant over the last 400 years. This is a generational opportunity that we don't want to miss. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of work that's led up to this, but now as we get started on this, we really want the public to be engaged. We want to find out how the public wants to be, participate. We think this is just going to be an incredible opportunity for our country to have a discussion that perhaps we've never had before or we've never had it like we can have it now. Mm -hmm. So tomorrow, just for people to have an idea of the events for tomorrow at 8.30, yes. tomorrow morning will be the uh, Ceremony by Project 1619 Incorporated, which um, will commemorate the Africans coming over. Yes, correct? there'll be a there'll be okay. a naming ceremony early in the morning. Then a little bit later, it'll be followed uh, by a prayer service, and then later on, there'll be a libations uh, service that will take place. And all that will happen between 8:30 and 11. It'll be an on, it's, it's a it's a, a, a ceremony that just continues, and so that will be going on till 11 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Then at 11 o'clock, we begin to transition the. The, uh, the, the bandstand area or the gazebo that we call it there in Continental Park, 
we'll begin to set up some additional chairs and transition that over. And at noon, uh, the governor, who also will have attended the project part of the Project 1619 ceremony, mm -hmm. uh, the governor will be coming out with some dignitaries and some, a national speaker. And we're going to be doing the launch event at noon for all of the 2019 commemoration, which I think is exciting that the state 2019 commission chose African Arrival Day as the day that they wanted to do the launch for the three the three events plus the African Arrival that you just described. Absolutely. So people can come out. It's free. Yes. Everyone should just come to Fort Monroe and participate. So, Terry, let me ask you, as the new superintendent of the mm -hmm. Fort Monroe uh, Monument, what does this mean to you in terms of what you want people to know about Fort Monroe? Well, thank you. It's, it's nice to be here. Um, and welcome to the area, by the thank way. Thank you. I, <laughs> I migrated from Massachusetts about a month ago, so I'm very new. Um, coming down here is very special because I'm not sure if the community understands what's here. This is the first arrival, and uh, having a national park in your backyard is really significant. And, and I like to take this opportunity to kind of define what our mission is a little bit. Most people think of national parks um, as these western landscapes, Grand Canyon, Yosemite. But a national park is a scenic and historical area that's protected by the government and generally is set aside for the public and to provide safety for wildlife. Mm -hmm. If you add the word service to that, national park service, our job is to protect, manage, and what we call interpret the history. And when we interpret the history, that means we have to set aside this land and explain to people why it's important. And it's really important for people of color in particular to visit, especially a place like this. I mean, I think I looked at numbers from 2011. 22% of minorities visited national parks. Yeah, Ken Burns did a huge mm -hmm. uh, documentary um, a couple of years ago on the national parks, and that was one of the points that came out, is that African Americans tend not to go yes. to national parks. Why do you think that is? Um, some of it is bad advertising on our part. Some of it is, um, if I had to be honest, I think some of us are fearful of going out in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I think that's part of our recruiting um, hiccups is, because when I was called into the park service, I had to go into the mountains. I didn't see anyone who looked like me. Um, I saw bears and buffalo, and and that was a challenge. But, I can imagine. You know, <laughs> after two weeks of hiking, canoeing, and fishing, and I got a paycheck, well. You were sold. I was sold. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a wonderful experience, and I, I'm hoping to educate the community here about what's in their backyard. Because if they do not protect this, it will leave. So we've mm -hmm. been talking about the fact that this is the, the first recorded landing. Mm -hmm. um, Tina, I'm going to ask you about some of this history. So for those who may not have learned this in school, because as I think back to my uh, growing up through um, in Baltimore, I learned about Massachusetts. I learned about Jamestown. I didn't know anything about Fort Monroe. So tell us the history of this. Well, the history of Fort Monroe, and more specifically, uh, the first landing, the first landing um, it can actually be uh, traced back to around August 20th, 1619, when the first 20 and some odd um, Africans, as is always referred to, uh, it was recorded that they landed here at Fort Monroe. And there's always a little ambiguity whether they were contraband or whether they were, well, whether they were slaves or free, and whether some of them um, actually had some sort of European training, whether they knew uh, the customs and things about Europeans. So the Africans came ashore at Port Comfort, which is now um, present-day Fort Monroe. And as we know, um, uh, President Obama actually declared this a national monument in 2011. Mm -hmm. So um, those Africans really came from different places, uh, Angola, and they were aboard uh, different ships. There's other stories concerning um, how there was a Spanish uh, uh, there was a battle ship that came, came to Florida, camp. right? Yes. Okay. yes, so there's always that talk. And we we know that uh, the valuable cargo actually came on a Portuguese merchant slave uh, ship, and there was a fight and everything. And some of, it's always different stories that you get. Mm -hmm. And those stories all land here at, you know, Fort Comfort. And 
those are the type of stories that we want to, you know, tell that haven't been told in those history books. And so we do know that once they came here and embarked, they were then sold as indentured servants? They were then, Is that right? Yes, they were okay. then sold as indentured ser servants. And then um, it always comes into the fact that they, you know, they became slaves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Vanessa, why, why is it that we didn't know this history before? And I'm so glad you asked me that because I wanted to, it kind of ties into what Terry was saying, why African-Americans don't go to national parks. Mm -hmm. um, so often I think, well, one, I don't think scholars have really, had really thoroughly researched. As Tina has said, you know, there are different versions of what has happened. So there's more scholarship now on um, the real story. And there um, is a fear, I think, of African, for African Americans to go to national parks as well as to museums and maybe to some libraries because they don't see themselves reflected mm -hmm. in that history because it's his story. So it can be told in many different ways. Are there things at the Hampton University Museum that, that reflect this history? Uh, well, we look at uh, some of the 16, 19, but not so much that. We're more... Um, after slavery during emancipation okay and with the founding of the school in 1868 okay and we're going to come to that right, because right. because fort monroe also played a, a role in terms of role. the yes. emancipation of slaves but i want to ask each of you to respond to this quote because i'm very curious as to what you all think about this so um senator thomas k norman jr he's the 2019 commemoration co-chair and he had this to say about 1619 he said, the year 1619 is a landmark for the United States and especially for Virginia. Three cultures, American Indian, English, and African, began forging the seeds of democracy, diversity, and opportunity. Do you agree with that statement? I mean, when you think about what had happened to the American Indian and to Africans, later African Americans, was this really the beginning of the forging of that, or did we have to work a little while before we got there? Well, I think you, have to, I think you certainly have to consider what, what is a beginning. Mm. Uh, you okay. know, there are, um, you know, you, could, you can certainly say uh, that it was a beginning. It wasn't a beginning where that it, that everybody was on equal terms, and that's what has taken so long. So you know, was it a beginning? Yes. Was it a beginning where all of these cultures were working together harmoniously? No, it was not. And, you know, that's been an interesting um, that's been an interesting journey for me as a legislator and somebody who's lived my entire life on the peninsula and so forth to, you know, to come to uh, Fort Monroe and to begin to learn this story because I didn't hear this story, you know, mm -hmm. when I was when I was growing up. And so to, to you know, to realize the story, virtually this revelation of how it began, um, it has been an eye-opening experience for me that has caused me to see many things in a different light. Uh, I will tell you that when I was a legislator, one of the things that I learned was be very proud of the fact that you were you're part of a 400 year continuous body. I mean, I it was it was just it was it wasn't taught to us, but it was you felt it. Mm -hmm. And then as I have come here, and as I have began be, began to to get involved in 2019, I'm beginning to think, you know, that first legislative body, you know, uh, wasn't quite exactly what what the body is that we have today. Um, you know, it was the one where you know women were recruited. It's the one where we took land away from the native people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the one where, uh, you know, where Africans were enslaved. So it's not quite the same. It's, it's, a, it, it's a different perspective, and it's a different mindset that I think that we all, that, that I know that, I'm, that I am growing into. Mm -hmm. So that's, you want to react yeah, to that? That <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely agree. It's, it's, it depends on who's looking at the story and who's telling the story. Mm -hmm. And I think it's all relative. Um, because you could say the Native Americans were very welcoming and may have been harmonious and then things happen, yeah. you know. Right. And so the more scholarship, the more this story is put out by Fort Monroe, the National Park, Hampton, and everyone, you know. So it's important that we're having this commemoration so that people can begin to learn and definitely it needs to be incorporated into the school books. And Tina, isn't this an opportunity then for, as I think Lynn said earlier, generations to be able to come, or one of you said, for generations to be able to come and actually really start to learn more about our history? And why is it important that we know about our history? Well, absolutely, Barbara. It's important that we know about our history so that we can set a blueprint and a foundation for our future generations. Um, I've been on this, uh, I've been talking a lot um, in our uh, library circles and our literary circles about 
how it's imperative that as um, cultural organizations, we retain this history. We get those stories. We make sure that we include not only those state and federal agencies that tell the story, but also those grassroots organizations who have done the research. Mm -hmm. And we want to get their stories. We want to include them also. And what we're doing now at Hampton University, um, especially the museum and the archives, we're beginning to um, do things with digitization. We're increasing our digital scholarship and our digital footprint mm -hmm. so that we will be able to not only have this information in-house for researchers, but for the entire world to see so that we can get them to visit Fort Monroe and get them to come to the national parks mm -hmm. and make sure that we're telling our history because it's so imperative to do that because if our history is with us, we can tell it and we can make sure that they know the importance of our history. Mm -hmm. We can be proud as Virginians, as African Americans, and really develop um, people who have who are so proud of their history and make sure that they know who they where they come from. And it also keeps us from repeating yes. things that may have happened Same in the past mistake. if Absolutely. we understand Absolutely. exactly what our history is. Um, audience, because we are live here at Fort Monroe, we cannot take phone calls. However, you can send in your questions to our Facebook page. That's at Another View Radio. Dot org. Um, and you can look us up on Facebook um, or on our page, anotherviewradio.org, or go to Facebook and look up Another View Radio. And studio audience, uh, studio, <laughs> 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 sitting in the grass audience over there. <laughs> if you all have a question, just raise your hand and we would love to, to bring you on. Terry, so you came from Massachusetts. Yes. So how are the people in Massachusetts taking this? <laughs> well, <laughs> Because they got the credit for a really long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. History is, uh, I'm in love with history. And I love what black people have done in this country. Um, the people in Massachusetts recognize what happened um, in this country. And they've been very supportive. I haven't ha had any pushback whatsoever. But I do want to piggyback on what sure. um, was said just a few minutes ago. Um, the National Park Service was created in 1916. That's almost 100 years ago, one week from now. Mm -hmm. And when the Park Service was created, about 50 years later, in around 1966, Congress decided to give some money to the National Park Service to sort of upgrade things. When it was created, we had 35 national parks. By 1966, we had an additional 56. So that means that the... The country is looking at national parks as places to go. Mm -hmm. Well, and this is post-World War II. Well, the majority of the people who were going to those parks were middle-class white people. I'll pause for a minute. <laughs> and those white people that brought their kids to those parks are now seniors today. They come to national parks. They support advocacy groups like the National Park Conservation Association, who pushes Congress for large budgets. And they give money to local organizations uh, like the National Park Foundation and local friend groups. And that's why my earlier conversation around tapping into the young audience is so important. Because if they have the experience of coming to this park, walking, fishing, sitting on the beach, sitting under a tree and reading a book, if they do that with their parents, they're more likely to come back here 50 years from now and support us. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm really advocating. And that also me. makes sure that the history is preserved. Then. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And can I add sure, absolutely. just a plug for the National Park Service? Um, I've noticed through my museum career that the National Park Service has done an outstanding job for supporting African-American uh, museums, historic houses. So, for instance, um, the Booger T. Washington yes. Monument. Uh, I would take my friend's group. One year I went there, it was okay, it was nice. But once it became a part of the National Park Service, everything was preserved, you know, and it beefed up a bit. Mm -hmm. Same thing with a lot of um, places in uh, Maryland, the Frederick Douglass House. Yes. Um, also, I just was at Tuskegee. Went there during a hurricane to run away when I lived in <laughs> South Carolina. <laughs> and so I had a chance to visit the Tuskegee Museum and see, um, what's his name? George Washington Carver. Sure. Mm -hmm. And it was not professional. Mm -hmm. um, and went back this past summer. It was like, oh, my God. Yeah. So the okay. Nash Par yeah. National Park Service has done a lot to help African-Americans and everybody see the story mm -hmm. and, and, you know, become a part of that history. So I just wanted to give that shout out. And, and, and I appreciate that. And, Terry, also I'm going to let you give a shout out about the fact that there are careers 
yes. that maybe African Americans may not be thinking I, about I think in terms of the national park. One service. of the things that's so wonderful about this agency, they are all about trying to recruit minorities and diverse audiences. And um, there are a number of ways that um, you can get in. Um, if you're in college, there's what we call the pathway program. Uh, we sort of set aside a position. And when you graduate, you can move right into that position. Um, we have people from all walks of life. We have archaeologists. We have maintenance people. We have superintendents. I, I happen to be African-American, <laughs> so anything is possible, right? <laughs> so it's, it's really a, a beautiful agency. And I'm not just saying that because I'm on the radio. It is a beautiful agency. Mm -hmm. When I first was tasked to go and work in the National Park Service, I went in thinking that I'm going to be in an all-white audience and nobody's going to really appreciate me. Those, it, the, the communities that I went into embraced me. The stories that I realized that I could tell. For example, in, in Philadelphia, if you go inside the assembly room where the Declaration and the Constitution was signed, we know that most of those men signed the Declaration happened to be white, right? Mm -hmm. Well, when you start doing the research, some of them, if not most, own slaves. And I thought, if I start talking about that, I might have a problem. <laughs> but... Uh, what I've realized is that the American people want the story. They want and the truth. They want the truth. Mm -hmm. And we can't be afraid to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. You have to open that dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I think the National Park Service, part of our mission is storytelling. Think about it. If you go out to the Yosemite or to the Grand Canyon, you go to Dr. Martin Luther King's National Historic Site, thank God they're, sir, they're <laughs> saved. You know what I mean? Yeah. And we get the chance to tell that story. It's beautiful. So, Glenn, yeah. there was something else that happened here at mm -hmm. Fort Monroe that had to do, fast forward several hundred years, um, that had to do with African, um, African Americans, well, actually slaves, and their emancipation. So talk to us about that. What happened? There is the most incredible arc of history that I have yeah. ever seen that occurred here at this property at Fort Monroe. Uh, Senator Mark Warner actually refers to it as one of the most significant sites in our country for African Americans, and yet... We don't even know the story. We don't tell the story and so forth. But 242 years after these first Africans were delivered here and after the tragedy of them being you know, enslaved and, and the, the enslavement that took place for the next 242 years, and in May of 1861, the country was hanging in the balance. Lincoln had been elected uh, president. I always refer to that when people talk about how bad the election is this year. I go, well, Mary, it was really bad back then, too. The country <laughs> divided. Yeah. But anyway – so Lincoln gets elected. The you know South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, they're starting to secede. There is this uh, Virginia's hanging in the balance. Lincoln decides he doesn't want to lose Virginia. If he loses Virginia, he doesn't want to lose Fort Monroe. So Lincoln pumps 10,000 troops from the New England area uh, into the fortress here at Fort Monroe. Virginia secedes. He finds a general he brings here named Benjamin, ben Benjamin Butler, who is both a wannabe politician and a, um, uh, and a lawyer. And what ends up happening is the next night after he arrives, three men, Frank Baker, Shepard Mallory, and James Townsend, who were enslaved men, uh, their master or owner, however you refer to them, was in Hampton. But they had been sent as contract laborers across the water over to the area where Sewell's Point is, much where you would see the aircraft carriers today. They had heard that when they finished their work there that they were going to be sent south. They feared they would never see their families again. And so what they did was they got in a rowboat that night. They rowed across this treacherous harbor. I can't imagine the courage it must have Honestly. taken for them to have done that. And they landed here at Fort Monroe. They hailed the wharf. The soldiers let them come in. They ran to the fortress walls and to the gate. The Union soldiers let them in. Benjamin Butler interviewed them that night. Wanted to know everything he could about them. You know, what were the Confederates doing, et cetera, and so forth. The next day. The Confederates show up under a white flag of truce. They say they want their slaves back. General Butler himself goes out into the streets, the very streets that you can walk on today, and has a debate with these men about slavery. At some point in the debate, uh, they demand to have their slaves returned, uh, that he has to do it because it's a, it's a legal requirement. He says, absolutely not. You're no longer part of the union. Then they say, well, they're our, they're our property. And like any good lawyer watching for that moment, he says, oh, you call them your property and you're using them against me. I will then declare them contraband of war. And with that, he rode back into the fortress and kept them. The word spread like a spiritual electronic telegraph <laughs> through the community, the slave community, that the slaves were not returned. 
It is almost as if the exact site in our country where the stain of slavery began, that the hand of God reached down and divinely began to blot out that stain. Oh, it sends chills down your spine, doesn't it, oh, Vanessa? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the way he portrays it. Exactly. Yeah, nice. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> if you're just joining us, we're live on the grounds of Fort Monroe in Hampton, Virginia, the site of the launch of American Evolution, Virginia to America, 1619 to 2019, with Glenn Oder, Executive Director of the Fort Monroe Authority, Terry Brown, Superintendent of the Fort Monroe National Monument, Tina Rollins, Director of the Hampton University Library, and Vanessa Thaxton Ward, Director of the Hampton History Museum. It is so ironic to me that that it would start in 1619 and then, as you, be, as you said, the beginning of the, of the freedom would go from there. I would think we have a question from our audience. Hi there. Oh, good morning. I'm Bismarck Myrick, and I have a question Hello, for the. How are you? <laughs> okay. Uh, I have a question for the panel. Uh, uh, this commemoration is uh, extremely impressive, and I'm just wondering if the uh, Park Service or others uh, are thinking about uh, establishing the linkage uh, between uh, these first uh, Africans in 1619 and their home communities uh, in uh, in Africa. Okay. Who wants to take that on? Jerry? Well, <laughs> I'm certainly I'm only a month here, but um, I, I'm sure I could speak for the agency. We're we're definitely in the camp of connecting um, uh, this story to all stories that tie into it. So um, and I'm open fact, to that. For yeah, sure. tomorrow uh, during the the um, launch commemoration, there will also be some representatives, I believe, from some of the African countries. Um, so, so yes, they're they're working on that. And, yeah, and let me just can. add, is that, that right? And especially uh, Project sixteen nineteen, as yeah. the founder of the of the, the founding ceremony, they uh, they have done a great job of researching this history and reaching across the ocean. Um, you know, we talk about this as being a Fort Monroe story, and then we say, oh no, it's a Virginia story, and then we say, oh no, it's a national story. The truth of the matter is, this is an international story, and this is where this is where you know these cultures need to come together and recognize. Mm -hmm. What took place here and where it began? I mean, how many times? How many times do you know when you're trying to resolve a problem that you say, "Where did it begin?" And if you go back and find out, find out where it began, it what what it maybe it changes the dialogue. I just real quickly, one of the things that I've learned is that the letters that the uh, soldiers here, New England soldiers, many of them had never seen an enslaved person before, the letters that they wrote home to uh, back to Massachusetts. When they had met these first enslaved people, they were amazed that they that they they were not seeking retribution on their masters or their owners. What they wanted was they wanted to be able to worship in freedom, and they wanted to be educated. And the idea that Mary Pete came here and with others ended up creating something where the legacy goes all the way to Hampton University. The idea that we have four churches in Hampton that have direct ties back to the contraband. That's the legacy that I think is so impressive. I wonder how many people out there who have lived in Hampton Roads all their lives have no idea yeah. that this, this much history lives right here. So, okay, bring in Hampton University. Okay. Where, what happened and how did how did Hampton, Hampton Institute back then, I guess it was, right. or Hampton Normal School. Hampton right? Normal Industrial and Agricultural School mm. um, was founded in 1868 by Samuel Chapman Armstrong, who actually came to the Tidewater area to work here near, at Fort Monroe, I believe, as a um, officer, he had been a military officer where he had um, commanded black troops. And so when the war ended, the Civil War ended, he wrote to his uh, mother who was uh, in Hawaii. His parents were missionaries there. And he said he wanted to start a school different from what was being started by the uh, American Missionary Association. So there were little schools and things that had been established for African Americans um, or the newly freed um, slaves. And so he began Ham Hampton on the model of a normal industrial agricultural school, which was um, very much what he grew up learning about in Hawaii. And that would be teaching and, uh, and agriculture. Is that, yes, it that was, would be the um, major focus? The normal was the teaching, mm -hmm. teacher's training. And then the manual included um, industrial arts, um, shoemaking, various trades, agriculture. And often people might say, well, why would you teach that to people who have worked <laughs> as slaves um, or who were slaves? And what he was doing, though, was retraining them to operate in this newly emancipated status. 
you know, with everything going on, it was a lot of confusion. Um, even though that Slab Town had been established, African Americans were starting their communities. Slab Town. Slab Town is also a bit of our history. <laughs> that is where the Hampton Golf Courses are. City of Hampton Golf Courses. This was a little um, area that the African Americans rebuilt after the um, Northerners came in and tore up Hampton, burned down the city of Hampton, and um, established this this area oh, to live. Okay. And really what they wanted Armstrong to do is to come in and kind of give the land back <laughs> to the white owners, previous owners. Mm -hmm. And so he came into a lot, you know, that Butler did a lot. There was a lot going on. <laughs> lot going on. Mm -hmm. And so he established Hampton um, with uh, 15, te 15 teachers or two teachers, 15 students, old army barracks from the war, and the mansion house that still is on our campus, uh, built in 1828, that was the only property left on the campus. And Hampton also um, uh, educated uh, Native Americans. Yes, that happened 10 years later in 1878. So um, General Armstrong was a fascinating man for his time. Um, we always have uh, different debates and also trying to explain to our students who may not understand um, because, you know, everything is about context. And so I feel he was a very, very brave man to come into this area, start a school for African Americans, 10 years later, bring in American Indians, and he also educated women. And that was not... Uh, he, a, was really, a, he was really he cutting was edge. He was really out there, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, Tina. And I just wanted to, Tina to chime in to, to kind of um, restore myself historically. <laughs> um, when Glenn was telling a story about Fort Monroe, just to see how interconnected we are, when those slaves who were um, who were uh, designated as contraband of war, they actually fled to um, they fled behind Union lines um, to Camp Hamilton at the Union Hospital, which is uh, which was a site which would be the site of Hampton Institute. So we're oh. all connected. When they fled, it actually went over to what was the site of Hampton Institute and Hampton University. So it all can all, it all connects together. together. Yeah, okay. And there were just some. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. There was just no, 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 some. There was and there were so many. I mean, I, I just wanted to get this one point in because I always try to make the story relevant to today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they first there was those three men, and then they, they believe it was three more, and the next night it was eight, and then it was, it was dozens, thousands. and, and, and <laughs> then it was so like then the it great migration like, from and, south. Until <laughs> what we believe is almost 10,000 slaves wow. were seeking their emancipation mm -hmm. under the guns, under the protective guns of Fort Monroe, on into Camp Hamilton and, and other places. And so what I like to say is Fort Monroe is the site of the first successful civil rights movement that took place in our country. All wow. right, I like that. And wow. I think that's a great way to just catapult <laughs> it. Right into, right into today. rel today's relevance. I, I refer to Fort Monroe as the most historically relevant site in it our really country. Is. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. Agree. Thank you. Okay, we have a question from our audience. Oh, more like a statement. Okay. Good morning. Hi. Afternoon Good now. afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Gloria Presley. I live here at the Chamberlain. Oh. I've had the opportunity of at one time speaking with Mr. Odom when he came to us at um, the Chamberlain. I call it my home by the sea now. <laughs> I want to fast, fast forward to the t today's Hampton Institute, Hampton University. This past Founders Day, I was the recipient of the Presidential Award, Citizenship Award. I mentioned that to Mr. Odom, and I said to him, I said, you know, we need to have a representative from Hampton University here at the Chamberlain. I'm here on the grounds. I'm willing to volunteer. I'm willing to be on a committee. I haven't heard from you, but I'm uh -oh. still. And so often, uh -oh. this is why, this is why we don't know as much because we are not involved in committees and um, volunteering, but I'm available. Well, I guess you know, we will make sure that we get her name and number and, and, and make sure we get you connected. Tell us we'll get her name and number right away. That when um, the Indians came to be served, Booker T. Washington right. was selected to be their president on the campus, yes, their principal was. as such, yes. wow. in the building called the Wigwam. Wow. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you being here. Absolutely. So tell us, um, Vanessa, some of the things that we see in if we visit the Hampton University Museum. Okay. In terms of, of where we're talking about in terms mm -hmm. of slavery and emancipation and so forth. Well, um, we are, we do have a history. We do have the history, but we're more art and um, other artifacts. So in reference to the history of the school and what we've talked about, we have a small section um, that 
talks about Freedom Ford and uh, General Armstrong establishing the school. And we have also a little area that we um, call the Hampton History Gallery, where we do historic vignettes. Um, we need to raise more money and get out there so that we can tell all of our story. But there we rotate exhibitions that will look at various mm -hmm. um, things that deal with the history of the school. As far as the industrial arts, we have furniture made by the students in the trade school, beautiful mm -hmm. um, antique pieces. We have um, agricultural tools. So all those things that relate actually to the college, to the university and its history. As well as in our university archives, we have General Armstrong's papers. Um, we have one of the most well-documented archives of not only our artifacts, but the history of the school. The school itself. And I, just, I just wanted to chime in about the archives with Vanessa because we work very closely together. Um, those things that are archival, like uh, Armstrong's papers, those are the things that we are looking towards doing more with to make it accessible to the public also. Mm -hmm. And we're actually making a lot of efforts and looking for uh, grants and everything to make those things happening. We're partnering with organizations like the HBCU Library Alliance. So a lot of the photographs and different things about the early history of the university and the area, those things are documented with the HBCU Library Alliance. And those photographs are digital. So we're just doing a lot of work. It's a lot of work to be done. And we're just <laughs> fighting the Fight and fight and keep going. And well, and I want to make a point, too, because a lot of times I hear from, from non-African Americans who feel that, like you said, working with the HBCU Alliance and others, that they may not be um, feel included mm -hmm. in terms of being able to come in. This mm -hmm. is everyone's history. Right. I Correct. think that's the point. I, I was, you <laughs> stole it right from it because <laughs> it's important that those who are listening, um, African American history is American history. Uh, and we have to embrace it, the good and bad of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Africans, when they left their country, they came here as either um, slaves or explorers. And when they arrived here, they brought with them their music, their values, their aesthetic values. They were among the first to encounter the Native Americans. They had ex extensive experience in cultivating rice, sugar, and <laughs> cotton. Mm -hmm. And all these things were important in developing a hybrid American culture. So I think when we start talking about American history, we have to make sure that this story is included. And it's nice to have this conversation today. I just want to make a plug for the National Park Service. And I mentioned earlier that we were created in 1916. We're celebrating our 100th birthday yes, next week, are. August 25th. <laughs> And for parents that are listening, we have this program called Find Your Park. You can hashtag it, hashtag Find Your Park. And just go to everykidinapark.gov, and your child can print out a ticket, and it gives them access to every national park in the U.S. for free. And you get have access to over 2,000 recreational areas. In some parks, it's $30 to get in. So wow. it's really important. So And, and uh, Superintendent Brown would love for you to come Absolutely. to Fort Monroe. Absolutely. I know there's a gentleman in our audience with the contraband, um, working on contraband, contraband story. Do you, would, do, would you like to say a few words? Right here, Lisa. I'm sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Philip Adderley. I'm the acting president of the Contraband Historical Society. Mm -hmm. Uh, been on the ground running for more than 15 years to ensure that this uh, historic site is preserved as a national park, first and foremost, uh, and second, that the contraband story be alive and well in the community. Ms. Jerry L. Hollins, our founder, uh, now deceased, worked tirelessly because she was taught by her grandmother of this story. And we just want to ensure that it continues uh, as well as uh, the fact that the, the first landing, mm -hmm. uh, that it also be preserved. There's no monument to that, and I think that's what this commission should be all about and hopefully will be about in 2019. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. We appreciate that. So go ahead, Glenn. I was going to say, uh, enjoy, I always enjoyed uh, working with Phil and talking with Phil. And one of the things that we have been able to do recently, because everyone said, what's going to happen at Fort Monroe and what's going on? Mm -hmm. uh, what we have been able to do is we have been able to redirect five and a quarter million dollars uh, at Fort Monroe, uh, away from some infrastructure projects to the renovation of an existing building at Fort Monroe, which was the former Coastal Artillery School Library. And we're going to renovate that building into the Fort Monroe Visitor Center. And while it's going to be the Visitor Center and it's going to be full of welcoming information and it's going to be your orientation to Fort Monroe, the primary stories that we're focusing on with the architects to tell in that story is the arrival story, 
It's the Captain John Smith trail story so that we can talk about the native people that were here. And then it's also going to be the contraband story. You know, these stories have been here. They've almost been cocooned for mm -hmm. 200 years while the Army occupied the property. Again, we have a generational opportunity. The Army's not here anymore. The Army's transferring the property to the Commonwealth of Virginia. Five years ago, we couldn't have had this discussion like we can today. And that's what's so exciting. And so the Visitor Center, working with the National Park Service, working with community groups, working with groups like Phil just mentioned, we're going to come up with a way to tell this story so that it is our history and it is our American history and it's an international story. We think it's going to be a game changer for Fort Monroe, for the city of Hampton, for the region, and especially for this whole story. It's going to be a right. national story. And just and to, sure. to add to what Glenn is saying, um, I know that Hampton University, uh, the history department, is looking at doing some type of grant or something to work with them. Yes. And it goes back to your question um, about people feeling that, you know, like maybe um, white people feeling like they are not welcome to come to the museum. It's just the hand, the black story. No, I think the partnerships that we can um, create mm -hmm. will help alleviate that problem, you know, because I am so tired of hearing people say, oh, we didn't know we could come over here. Oh, yes. we didn't know you were here. And we are such, we don't want to be the hidden treasure. We are the treasure. Yeah. Um, there's so much to see in our museum, but I think as we work together and share um, the story that that will Help. So I, I know how excited we are about listening to this and finding out all of this information. I wonder from the two of you at Hampton first, um, are students becoming more interested in, in actually delving in and doing the research and, and continuing to find out more? Yes, they are. Um, we have some of the best students in the world at Hampton University. <laughs> Shout out to Hampton University. Um, <laughs> our students are I can great. Hear all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> our, our new oh, freshmen God. are arriving today all bright, shiny, and new. So, you know, we have some of the best students at Hampton University because they are thinkers and they are learners, and they're, they're so willing to learn about their history. But, you know, we keep going back to this theme of everyone and everything being in interconnected. And it's so imperative that our students know about those, those cultural things that, that came from Africa. Like with this uh, com commemoration this weekend, you know, we're going to see tribal dances and everything. Well, will they know that stepping came from that? But to actually see that and connect it together. It connect. And then when you see uh, things like the hairstyles and then you get into other conversations in pop culture about you know cultural misappropriation why is it that we're saying that and all the other things that are going on all of it is connected together and our students that are thinkers those are the questions that they ask those are the things that we find that they research in the library those are the conversations that we're we're having with them um and it's just it's just a great time to be amongst young people and to be amongst young people who are aware and who are thinkers and learners. And we, we have a diverse population at Hampton University. Right. Even though we are HBCU, we have done a lot with international outreach. We have a wonderful international um, outreach office there. Um, some wonderful faculty, staff, professors that are really doing a lot to bring our students together. So we really want our students to learn. And they're, they're becoming so immersed in who they are and wanting to not only learn who they are, but learn who they are so they can give back to our communities and teach those after them. And then how do we get this story and make sure that it is in the history book so that when my six-year-old granddaughter is coming up, that she learns about this story? How do we do that? Well, we know it's already being, uh, it's beginning to be included now into the SOLs. And so that's that's very, very important. Uh, you know, it's the uh, as I understand it, I'm, I'm really getting over my skis here, but the SOLs, uh, you know, have just gone through a process. And so Standards they're, of learning for yeah, those who aren't familiar. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, but we understand that there, we, we, we specifically know that parts of the story were, were incorporated. I think they're reviewed every seven years. Um, if they're reviewed, so what we want to do is we want to tee ourselves up so the next review we get them even better told and, and more in there. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing. So that's for Virginia, but what about the rest of the country? Well, right. I've already had a uh, brief meeting with Congressman Scott. And, you know, if you had to ask me, Glenn, what is the grand vision for Fort Monroe? You know, when I first got here, people said, you know, don't you want to have the Slave Museum at Fort Monroe? And I was like, well, if the Slave Museum came to Fort Monroe, I guess I'd be fine. But, you know, they were really not the story of slavery. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of, of, of selling. We're the story of freedom. Yeah. We're the story <laughs> of freedom. Exactly. And so what if, what if we began to work with Hampton University and the National Park Service and we began to find scholars that wanted to study the great concepts of freedom in our country today? And not just for everybody, every from Caitlyn Jenner all the way to those, con those, those contraband slaves. What does it mean to be free today? What if 
Fort Monroe could become the national center for freedom in our country. All of a sudden now we are a national site with an endowment and people come here and they do scholarship studies and so forth. We think that, that that's an exciting vision. I, mean, for what, what I just ahead, wanted to add. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, let me if, grab Terry and then I'll come to you. Okay. okay. You know, what if we're a site where people can have a comfortable conversation exactly. around race? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That is so hard. I mean, we were just having this conversation about um, people feeling like they're not welcome. We have to change that because mm -hmm. this thing called racism is never going to change unless people feel and just, open enough to and have just those so you know, Terry, we we have been doing a series called Race. Let's talk about it. Oh, and we held our town halls here at Fort Monroe. Oh, really? So, yeah. Absolutely. You're right on, and we're going to be Very moving, and we're going to be doing another one coming up in the spring. So, That's awesome. So we'll be working with you on that. Go ahead, Vanessa. I just wanted to add that we have national as well as international scholars that visit our archives. So that is a way. We okay. have um, them coming, and they're doing research, as I said, all the way from General Armstrong and the history of the city of Hampton. We have a lot of that information, as well as the Hampton History um, Museum, who has a lot of um, archival information and the Hampton City Library. Mm -hmm. They have a wonderful collection of um, historic material. And as the scholars are um, becoming more and more interested um, in this subject, then it can get into the history books and the books for our children. Tina. Just wanted to add that our university library also has a wealth of research materials related to the study of African American history and culture. Um, our Peabody collection is mm -hmm. awesome. Um, we have scholars from all over who visit on the same day the archives and the special collections in the Peabody area. So we are here to support that research. We're part, we would be glad to partner with you. I know the university okay. library would. So uh, it's great to start that conversation now. So we'll Absolutely. keep that conversation going. Unfortunately, we are out of time. No this way. Uh, Can you believe uh, that? Uh, but I really appreciate it. I know we want to invite everyone to come on out to Fort Monroe tomorrow morning, 830. Through, come spend the day. Come enjoy and learn and be a part of this commemoration. And I want to thank uh, Glenn Oder and Terry Brown and Tina Rollins and Vanessa Thaxton Board for joining us today. And we will be right back. Hi, I'm Claude McKnight of Group Take 6, and you're listening to Another View, Fridays at noon at WHRV 89.5 FM. I know, the audience is laughing because I was dancing to the music. Okay. <laughs> The 2016 Olympics are drawing to a close. During the past two weeks, we've seen talented athletes from around the world showcase skills and shatter records. We also thought it was the perfect time to share a little Olympic history with you. So here's the question. Did you know that during the 1936 Olympics, other than Jesse Owens, there were 17 other black athletes on the U.S. team? Our Lisa Godley recently spoke to the creator of a documentary that tells their stories. It's called Olympic Pride, American Prejudice. This is one of the great tragedies of the story you tell. As you have 17, 18 athletes here who were on the world stage. One of them is remembered. Owens matches the Olympic record in the 100 meters with a swiftness and elegance which makes him the darling of the huge crowd. They represented a country that repeatedly told them they weren't good enough to use the same restrooms, drink from the same water fountains, or even sit in the same place, be it a movie theater, a restaurant, or the front of a city bus. But in 1936, 16 African-American men and two women crossed the ocean to take on Adolf Hitler and discredit his theory of Aryan superiority by capturing medal after medal during the Summer Olympic Games in Berlin. Athletes like 400-meter gold medalist Archie Williams. The final of the 400 meters. And here it is. Brown's in the outside lane there. Next to him, Williams, the American Negro. I'm going low, but he's leaving it too late. That Negro is dangerous. The film's writer and director, Deborah Riley Draper, first learned of the athletes while researching the life of jazz trumpet player Valeta Snow. There was a story, this article that she was in where she recounted these 18 African Americans that she should have gotten back on the boat with them when they left Germany. And I'm thinking, what? 
who, when, where? And that's when the light bulb went off. I was like, I really want to do this story. I actually want to figure out who these people were, what's their story, and why don't I know their story? Stories like Matthew Mack Robinson, the older brother of baseball legend Jackie Robinson. Mack came in second to Jesse Owens in the 200-meter dash, capturing a silver medal. What would happen if Mack Robinson wasn't on that team? Would Jackie, his brother, have integrated baseball? This eye-opening documentary is Draper's second. Her first film, Versailles 73, looks at the first black models in the world of high fashion. Variety calls her one of the 10 docu-makers to watch. It's a talent this former advertising executive has had for a very long time. My earliest recollection is like, preschool and you know how the teacher says we're going to do a play and I was like okay I know just the play and then I started telling everyone what to do and I didn't know that was directing at that moment but I knew I enjoyed putting people in places and helping craft a story. The research alone was a four-year process. The journey took Draper from America to Europe and back again interviewing everyone from the athletes' families to German spectators who as children were eyewitnesses to the historic 1936 Olympic Games. It also allows us to examine closely the country the athletes called home, how dramatically America has changed for the better, yet struggles to address its past injustices and the wounds that remain as a result. 2016 and 1936, there's an 80-year span, but there's an unconscious bias that exists in the exact same way it existed 80 years ago because we haven't really dealt with it as a country. We're dealing with it, but um, in the 30s, there was a tremendous amount of lynching. We, as African Americans, had a very contentious relationship with law enforcement and the police. The mob might get you later that night, drag you out of jail, and hang you from a tree. Draper says Olympic pride American prejudice is more than an African-American history lesson. It's American history and a story of global proportions that's long overdue. This is a story that involves politics, socioeconomic movements coming together. This is the most infamous Olympic stage in history. And you're coming out of the Depression, and there are two nations trying to establish their nationalism. So you get some pre-World War history right there. You get some African-American history, German history, Jewish-American history. And we understand how those dynamics work to create the industrialized nation we get to live in right now. For another view, I'm Lisa Godley. So history and more history. And we invite you to come to Fort Monroe tomorrow, beginning at 8.30 a.m. with a commemoration of the first African landing, a beautiful ceremony provided by Project 1619 Incorporated, followed by the official kickoff of American Evolution, Virginia to America 1619 to 2019 at noon. I'll serve as your MC for this event, so come on out and enjoy. The first African-American woman to take home the gold in swimming happened at the Rio Olympics. Next week on Another View, we dispel the myth that black folks can't swim. It's Another View on Health with Dr. Keith Newby. Our theme music was composed by Jay Sennett. Lisa Godley is our show producer. Special thanks to audio engineers Ray Lenz and Victor Bowen. I'm Barbara Ham Lee. Thank you so much, live audience, for joining us today. We appreciate you. I hope to see you tomorrow for the 2019 commemoration events. And let's get together again next Friday at noon for another view.